Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. You will be praying, right? You said that you would. Uh, Kung, you said that you would pray, right? Uh, okay, first I'll pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Heavenly really, Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, um, God, for uh, another new day, God. Um, Lord, um, we ask you uh, to reveal uh, um, or if you to us uh, that uh, we will draw closer to you and that uh, what you're saying, Lord, into our lives. Uh, thank you, God, for. Uh, Um, everything that you are uh, amen yes thank you so much all right um so uh we've come to the very last epistle that we are covering in our current course uh that would be second thessalonians uh, we are we're already familiar with the thessalonians because we uh, looked at the previous letter and um, we saw in the high uh, you know uh, respect with which paul spoke about them he said that they were that their faith and their love and their hope uh, was such that they in fact became a model to all the um, macedonian and achaean churches in that entire region so um, these were very godly people and um, um, uh, Paul had personally invested in their lives to a great extent because he talks about that. He talks about how they are almost like his own children um, and how he cares for them deeply. And um, even these people reciprocate that feeling because, you know, they say to uh, they send word through Timothy that they are, you know, that they have pleasant memories of, uh, of Paul and the others who taught them. And they're then and that they're eagerly looking forward to the time when Paul will come back. Um, so we see a lot of uh, uh, a very uh, personal tone, you know, in First Thessalonians. So um, now we now we come into Second Thessalonians, and we get the impression that this uh, letter was probably written a little later, uh, and this letter was written uh, because somebody started spreading this false teaching that uh, the second coming of the Lord had already finished taking place and that for some reason these Thessalonian believers got left behind you know so that was the kind of wrong teaching that was going around and it must have been very painful for to the Thessalonians to even think such a thought and uh, so when Paul gets to know about this he immediately writes to them a second letter uh, so in this letter he's trying to you know um, assure them that the second coming has not yet taken place and he also talks about how they you know even as they are waiting uh, they need to um, prepare themselves better and also conduct themselves better in the previous letter when he you know referred to the second coming um, he he just talks about how they need to put on uh, the 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 breastplate of uh, of uh, truth and righteousness of of faith of faith and righteousness uh, you know uh, and uh, the helmet of salvation here he talks about another aspect of preparation that they need to you know think about uh, we'll we'll get to that in the third chapter uh, so um, these are just basically the main things which we, we we would be dealing with in second thessalonians so to get started off um, maybe we can look at verses 3 4 5 um, and there is a nice thought that we see you know uh, mentioned in these uh, verses so if we could have someone read out for us Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses three, four, and five. Yeah. Second Thessalonians verse, chapter one, verse three, four, and five. We ought always to give thanks to God for your brothers, as it's as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. 
Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God, for your steadfast and faith in all your persecutions and in the applications that you are enduring. And five. But this is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Uh, yes. So um, he first of all starts off by saying that he's glad, grateful, that their faith is growing more and more. Um, and then he says something. He talks about uh, how they are, you know, um, holding on even even in spite of persecutions and trials i know they are uh, holding on in faith then he makes the statement in verse 3 he says all this is evidence that god's judgment is right and as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of god so what exactly is uh, is he referring to over here what is this evidence what is this proof that is available which is showing very, very clearly that God's judgment is right. As far as we can see in the previous two verses, there does not seem to be any kind of direct proof being mentioned. So let's look at the, you know, the, the previous verse once again. Um, in, the, in, in verse 3, he talked about how um, he's glad that their faith is growing more and more and how they are living in love towards one another. He's grateful for that. And then in verse 4, he says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Uh, so the evidence over here showing that God's judgment is indeed right and correct and good. What is the evidence? It's the way these people are holding on uh, in spite of all the persecution that they are undergoing. Here are a bunch of people who have gone through very difficult times and it would have been easy for them to just go back to their, you know, whatever previous um, uh, idolatrous uh, practices that they had earlier. They could have gone back to that. But here are these people holding on, persisting, persevering in spite of all that, uh, you know, uh, all that they are facing. Why are they doing that? It is because they have, they are convinced in their hearts that what God has declared, that his judgment, that you know, um, his declaration that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, they believe that this is right and therefore they have taken their stand. And so uh, the neighbors who would have been watching them, you know, in the beginning, of course, you know, soon after they became believers, people would have thought, okay, fine, this is a new fad. That they are you know kind of adopting they it will pass with time so they would have waited and waited but the years are going by and these people are still holding on in their faith in spite of all the you know so, uh, social ostracization people have, have uh, kind of excommunicated them nobody talks to them if you're walking down the street and uh, you know um, uh, the other people look at you they turn their faces away nobody even wishes you it's a very uh, painful unpleasant way to live and in spite of all of that, these people are not giving up their faith. So that actually would have made all the neighbors and all the all of the others who are watching it would have made them wonder why are they still holding on? And the reason they are doing that is because they are clearly convinced that God's judgment is indeed right. And so because they fear God's judgment, because they believe in what God is saying about what is right and what is wrong, they are not willing to let go. And this is a, is a clear evidence and proof to the people who are watching that if they don't do the same thing, then yes, they will have to face the wrath of God's judgment in the future. Uh, so uh, by our lives, by the way we live, we will prove to the people around us that what we have chosen uh, to trust in is indeed correct. And we are looking forward to an eternal reward. And uh, if they don't, you know, uh, imitate us and come into the faith the way we have, they would they would have to face great danger in the future. There is, um, you know, um, uh, there is a threat uh, of 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 uh, judgment hanging over their heads, and so it becomes like a warning to them. Our right conduct, our holding on in faith, becomes like a 
like a piece of proof and evidence to them that there is something dangerous awaiting and to avoid that they better you know accept the lord jesus uh, so and now because these Thessalonians have been that kind of a testimony to their community uh, over here paul says as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of god for which you are suffering they are suffering for what they believe is right they believe that God's judgment is right and they have been suffering for it and therefore they will most definitely be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. You know, um, uh, is what it says over here. Uh, so we too, you know, need to adopt that same attitude. Um, uh, even when others mock us, even when others uh, disagree with us, uh, we choose to hold on. And by doing that, we are, you know, showing them you know what the, what i have believed in is right so reconsider the stand that you have taken you know reconsider because there is eternal judgment awaiting uh, so we become a witness to the people around us by our choices um and then um, maybe we can look at this uh, entire passage about how god will punish those who are um, you know unrighteous and who are persecuting um so maybe at one stretch we can look at verses 6 to 10. Uh, if we can have one person read out verses 6 all the way up to verse 10, please. And read. Yes. God just, God is just, he will pay back trouble, those who trouble you. And give relief, relief to you who are troubled, as to us as well. well. This will happen then when the Lord is Lord, Jesus, from heaven, blazing fire with his powerful angels, he will punish those who, who do not know God and do not obey. The gospel of, of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shattered out from the pre presence of the Lord and from the glory of, of his might. On the, on the day that he comes, be glorified. Right? In his house, holy, holy people, to be marveled at among all those who have this belief. This includes you because you believed it in our testimony to you. Thank you. Yes. So here we see, you know, in, in verse 10, it talks about what is awaiting these believers who are holding on so faithfully. It says on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people uh, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Uh, this includes you because you believed our testimony to you. So uh, right now they're going through hardships and trials, but a day will come when he will be standing there among them physically. And it says that they will just marvel at him when they look at him and they will just glorify him and they'll be filled with so much joy because for the rest of eternity, they're going to be living in his presence. They were, they're never again, you know, going to be uh, feel, uh, you know, alone or at a distance. Uh, so uh, they're literally going to be in the presence of this glorious God. So this great rejoicing awaiting them. On the other hand, you know, in the previous verse, look at what is awaiting these other people, uh, you know, who are right now persecuting them and making them suffer and mocking them. What's awaiting those people? It says um, they will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. You see, his might can either be uh, something that will bring uh, judgment upon you and, and release punishment upon you, or it can be a might which will act on your behalf to help you, to rescue you. So it's very sad that instead of enjoying the, the positive aspect of his might, you know, of, his, of the glory of his might, 
all that they are going to experience is the negative side of his power where they will just you know um uh, have to live under his wrath and judgment so they will be shut out from the presence of his glorious uh, might on the other hand these believers they will get to enjoy the glory of his might forever and ever uh, and um, then in you know in the uh, much earlier in the in verse 7 yeah in verse 6 you know um, uh, paul says god is just he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you so right now what they are going through is so painful I mean, because uh, I'm sure that even economically, these believers would have suffered, uh, you know, because um, they have they have now chosen to go against the religion of that place. Um, they probably would even be denied jobs. You know, people would not be willing to hire them and give them jobs. Uh, so these people have suffered a lot. But here Paul says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. So one day, you know, there would be relief that these people uh, would, would be able to experience. Um, and then he goes on uh, to talk about how, you know, these unrighteous people will be judged. And he says, uh, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. It talks about a time when Jesus will come back and he will judge these people. He will come with his powerful angels and he will punish them. Um, so what is uh, Paul referring to over here? Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, when he was talking about how they will be caught up in the air along with, uh, you know, the, the believers who have risen up from the dead, you know, when they're all caught up in the air with uh, Jesus, um, people say that that probably refers to the rapture event. Uh, so in that rapture event, if you observe, uh, there's no immediate punishment following. So if we consider the First Thessalonians chapter 4 as the rapture event, then we would have to think about this current passage that we are looking at, where it talks about the Lord Jesus being revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. We would have to think of this not as the First Thessalonians 4 event, but more most most probably the Zechariah 14, 3 to 4 event. Because in Zechariah 14, 3 to 4, uh, it talks about, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. Okay, so um, uh, it, it's the Zechariah event which talks about how uh, Jesus, when he comes, he will come to fight, he will come to judge, he will come to punish. Uh, so... Um, so if we are thinking of 1 Thessalonians 4 as the rapture event, then we would have to say that uh, um, when it talks over here about in 2 Thessalonians, when it talks over here about him coming in blazing fire, it's not referring to the 1 Thessalonians 4 event, but rather it is referring to the Ze Zechariah 14 event, where he will actually come down upon Mount Olives and stand over there. And when he does that, that uh, entire mountain will experience an earthquake and it will get split into uh, two. And then he will go out and fight the nations. Uh, you know, he will bring judgment against all these people who have been persecuting his church. Uh, so we see that. Um, and then um, moving on to verses 11 and 12. I've, I really find these verses very comforting and very encouraging. Um, if we can have someone read out verses 11 and 12, please. The best means we always pray to you that God be made to wait at his calls and may this ever resolve from joy, never work of faith by his works, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, the first thing, the first point is in verse 11 where it says, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. You know, when we all first get called and we come into the faith, um, we are all kind of, you know, messed up. We have just come out of the world. Our mind is still very unrenewed. Uh, we still have barely know the scriptures. 
uh, we are um, we still have a lot of training that needs to be done so it is god who starts making us worthy of his calling and he doesn't leave that you know uh, with any person i mean he doesn't um, you know miss out on any person every single believer who has been called the lord personally works with that person to make that person worthy of his calling you know so we none of us ever have to feel that oh okay you know i'm going to stay like this i'm never going to be able to change i will never really become like christ we don't have to feel helpless and hopeless about it because um, here paul and his team are praying for these people that god will do this for them so in the same way that paul and the team were were praying for these thessalonian believers if we were to pray for ourselves maybe maybe nobody else is praying for us but then if we were to pray for ourselves and say lord in the same way you helped them in the same way you made them so worthy that in fact they became you know models and examples to all the other uh, all the other uh, people in that entire region if you could do that in their lives would you do that same thing for me and the god who called you to his salvation he will make you worthy of his calling it's it's a promise that you know um, uh, that we can claim for ourselves and then it goes on to say something more it says that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness so we all have this desire inside us this this spiritual longing that we have to live in a way that pleases god um in in such a way where you know where he, he feels uh, satisfied with whatever we are offering him and um, so uh, it's that longing we all have that on that day when we actually you know uh, see jesus physically face to face we would like to hear him say those words you know well done faithful servant i mean um, that would be the ultimate pleasure so we all have that and here this this lovely thing that is being said it's saying that by his power god by his power he will make this thing happen this desire for goodness that we have within us he will bring it to fruition or in other to put it in simple words he will fulfill it he will make it happen um so by his power by his resurrection power it is possible uh, for us to have this desire of you know inside us to to be good to do things that please him we will be able to do these things because god will release his resurrection power to help us to become like this to become such people who will be able to please him and honor him so all we need to do from our side is you know lord uh, i pray to him and say lord make me worthy of your calling you use your resurrection power to help me fulfill this desire that i have to be good to live in a way that pleases you and honors you and the third thing that is you know that that we can pray for is uh, is uh, here it says your every deed prompted by faith so there are so many things that we want to do for the lord and these things are prompted by faith you know in faith we choose to become volunteers in the church um uh, you know we 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 do that we are volunteering because uh, we believe that the lord is good and we want to serve him in some capacity and we believe that whatever little service that we are offering is something that will bring pleasure to the heart of god so uh, this this volunteering that we take up in the church we are doing it um basically out of faith you know as a step of faith believing that this will in some way make a difference to the kingdom of god uh it may be a small bible study group that you have started so it's it, it's a step of faith why have you started this group you stepped out in faith and started this group because you believe that god is going to help you make this something very meaningful to the people uh that you uh, you know that, that god will um, um equip you to do this in such a way that there will be eternal fruit in the lives of many many people through this you know, bible study group so there are these little things you it may be something as simple as you know sharing the faith with uh, with a neighbor so you know you you interact with them daily you talk to them daily so you start telling them about how jesus has been wonderful in your life you know all that he's been doing for you 
So you just start talking about that. Why are you doing that? It's a step of faith that you're taking. You believe that when you do this, God will start working in that person's heart. And then an opportunity will come where you can openly tell about the cross and what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for that person. So these are all little acts of faith, steps of faith. You know, maybe you can, maybe you can call them faith projects. You, you've taken up these faith projects, believing that God will help you to, um, to accomplish something good. So that is why it says over here, uh, you know, in this prayer that these people are praying uh, for the Thessalonians, it says uh, that they are praying that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness, you know, your desire to be good and honor him, he will bring it to fruition. Also, your every deed that you are doing, you know, out of faith, prompted by faith, those things also he will bring to fruition by his resurrection power. So that little Bible, Bible study group that you are leading, that is going to have resurrection power in it because you're doing it out of faith. You see, it's what you, you're you not just doing it as a, out of a sense of duty. You're doing it out of faith, believing that God will take this little thing that you're offering and bring something good out of it. So um, it's, a, it's a lovely prayer to pray. And uh, then in verse 12, he says, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, when, when you do these two things by his power, by his enabling, then um, the Lord Jesus will be glorified. And not just that, he goes on to say, and you in him, you see, he will glorify you. He will reward you. He will one day praise you and say, you know, um, well done, faithful servant. Uh, so this is something that will uh, bring joy to his heart. And in fact, you also will feel very happy about it. And this is possible because God himself will make you worthy of his calling. By his resurrection power, he will bring to fruition your deep desire to honor him. He will bring to fruition every little deed that you do, which is prompted by faith, where you're doing it out of the simple childlike belief that God will take the little bit that you're offering and bring something you know, beautiful out of it. So um, uh, these are very encouraging verses that we can hold on to. And you know, um, based on these verses, we can step out in faith to really try and do something for him. You know, so uh, uh, th these are very encouraging verses. So uh, we've, uh, we'll move into chapter two, you know, which kind of focuses more on the uh, second coming, uh, where Paul, you know, is trying to um, uh, assure them that the second coming has not taken place already. And, the, and then he goes on to talk about some things which will happen before the second coming really takes place. Uh, now, this is a slightly complicated passage for me uh, because, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, whatever little bit I do know, you know, I can explain that. And uh, if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. But, you know, like I have said even last class, um, I'm not very deeply knowledgeable on all these end time uh, things. Uh, but, you know, let's just look at what the, what the passage has to offer. All right. So, uh, chapter two, if we can have someone read out verses one and two. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, if you remember when we did First Thessalonians and uh, we looked at the very first chapter. And over there, we saw that the main hope which these people had uh, was in the coming of Jesus Christ. You know, that was what was, you know, driving them. That was what gave them the ability to, you know, live in love and do works that uh, that were done, you know, produced out of faith. All that was, all the good, good, all the spiritual good that was going on in their lives, it was based on this one hope that Jesus Christ will come back and he will take them. He'll collect them. So that is their, uh, that is the main hope which they had. 
so first Thessalonians 1 verse 3 you know where it says um, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ so they were enduring they were going through so much and putting up with it and not letting go why because of this hope which they had in the Lord Jesus Christ so imagine when someone brought this really terrible teaching telling them that you know what the second coming has already happened all the other churches have already you know gone off along with Jesus Jesus has collected them and gone away and you people have been left behind what a, what a terrible uh, painful shock that would have been for these believers and so Paul is very very quick in trying to you know put to rest this kind of wrong teaching and so he says you know you don't have to worry about any such thing having happened he says that the day of the Lord uh, you know has not yet come and then he so so he says in verse 3 don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed so um, this second coming will happen only after uh, somebody who's against Christ a man of lawlessness a man who stands for everything that is against what God stands for which is why they use the word anti Christ you know so people who are for Christ um, are those who honor him but then here is going to be a person uh, and of course there have been many, many such people throughout history who are who are completely against everything God stands for uh, and they're, uh, they're against everything that Christ stands for so they are referred to as anti-Christs you know because they are standing for everything that goes against what God believes in and what uh, God has you know placed as being correct uh, so um, so he says you will know when the second coming is nearing because you literally see this person you know um, going about talking like as if he is the he's the true Christ that he is the true Messiah the word Christ right literally means anointed one uh, so um, the for, to the Jew to the Jewish people that base that term would basically mean the one who has been anointed and sent to us to be our Messiah you know so that's the word that word Christ literally means the anointed one the one who has been anointed by God as the Messiah uh, so this man would be presenting himself as the real Messiah the true Messiah so he would you know he would talk like as if he is better than um, than Jesus that he has more to offer than Jesus that he is more powerful than Jesus so he would be using all kinds of uh, miracles and demonstrations to um, to try and deceive people and convince them that uh, he actually is the long-awaited Messiah that you know people have been looking for. Uh, so he would be that kind of a um, person. Um, so maybe we can you know if, you, if someone could read out these two verses, uh, verses three and four. Yeah, verses three and four. Let no business be that they will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is with you, the son of destruction, who oppose and exalt himself against every so called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Yeah, you know, in fact, it goes on to say that this man uh, will not only just be a man of lawlessness uh, and who will exalt himself, um, you know, as though he is God. Uh, it also says that he will set himself up in God's temple. OK, so these are some things which are told about this person. Um, so in the in the past, there have been others who have, you know, behaved in this manner. Um, the earliest example, of course, would be you know Antiochus the the fourth, um, who was a Syrian king, isn't it? That person was a Syrian, if I can remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, it was yes, no, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, so um, he he captures Jerusalem in 167 BC, and at that time, you know, he uh, of course captures the temple as well. And inside the temple, he constructs an, an altar to his own god, uh, the god Zeus. 
and he begins to offer sacrifices on that um yeah in fact he he goes and um, um as sacrifices a pig over there uh, basically because um the jewish law had clearly instructed that the jewish people should never you know eat pigs so deliberately this man goes into the temple and he offers the sacrifice of a pig um on this new altar which he has built over there to his to honor his god zeus so uh, this man antiochus tries to establish himself um uh, like a god okay so um so will this new antichrist be somebody like that uh, we do not know but we have one example you know uh, from ancient jewish history of such a person even in the even in um, you know the these um, new testament times also we have one more example uh, that would be emperor gaius you know g a i u s also more popularly known as caligula uh, this um, emperor he had a statue of himself set up in the jerusalem temple and uh, he commanded all the people to worship that temple and of course the jewish people you know they resisted and they opposed and um, then uh, there were a lot of rebellions that took place all of that uh, so in the past there were people who went and set up a statue or set up an altar or you know uh, in the temple and then they declared that they should be worshiped uh, so um, will this new antichrist when he comes in the end times will he also do something like that because historically we know right the temple is no longer there in uh, 70 ad the jerusalem temple was destroyed and uh, then sometime uh, after that i mean after a few centuries or whatever uh, you basically had a, um, a a mosque being constructed over there so uh, right now we in the in the in the area where the jerusalem temple used to be now you basically have a mosque over there so over here when it says that um this person this antichrist who is coming he will exalt himself above all and that he will um yeah that he will establish himself in the in the in god's temple does it mean that at some point of time the jerusalem temple will get will get rebuilt and then will this man go over there to that rebuilt temple and kind of establish himself as the true messiah uh, we do not know okay so all this are different theories and assumptions that people come up with uh, just based on the few details that are given over here you know in this um, uh, in this in these verses um maybe we can you know uh, look at uh, daniel 11 36 to 37 where it may have been talking only about antiochus the uh, you know epiphanes or it might also have been implying about the end time uh, antichrist as well i mean i do not know but no harm in looking at the daniel 11 36 to 37 which talks about some kind of antichrist it might have been refer it might have been referring only to antiochus the fourth who already came and did what he did uh, in uh, in 167 bc or it might have been referring to a future antichrist as well so if someone could go to daniel chapter 11 36 to 37 and if you could read out that please daniel 11 36 to 37 then the king shall do according to his will he shall exalt the man who found himself above every god shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the god has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done he shall regard neither the god of his fathers nor the desire for wisdom of women nor regard any god for he shall exalt himself above them all yeah so when uh, daniel was given a prophecy he was told that a time is coming when there will be some kind of a person who will you know establish himself as being god and he will try to exalt himself above all other gods and all of that so there's a mention over here of such a person coming um so most people will just say that this is referring to antiochus epiphanes who came um, you know in 167 bc uh, but there are also people who say uh, this is probably also a future reference to the end time antichrist okay so um, 
we uh, we we do not quite know we would just have to leave it at that um so um yeah then uh, then in verses 5 6 and 7 uh, he refers to another aspect paul paul refers to another aspect of this um, end time event uh, verses 5 6 7 if someone can read we are in second thessalonians chapter 2 uh, verses 5 6 7 Do you not remember that, that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Yeah, you know, so here it talks about how um, evil is already at work, lawlessness is already at work in the world because you have so many people you know who are now um, uh, openly opposing uh, the christian faith and they are now coming up with uh, all kinds of new uh, legal rules which directly go against the principles of the bible so lawlessness is already at work uh, but it is kind of under control because somebody is holding it back Someone is not allowing the lawlessness to completely come out in in in, in, in entire in, in its entire full force. Uh, so someone at the moment is still holding back lawlessness to some extent, so that things don't become completely evil and bad. And so it says, um, the one, who, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till till he is taken out of the way. Okay, so. Um, um, most people say that this is referring to the Holy Spirit. So right now, the Holy Spirit is holding evil back, not allowing it to completely have you know free uh, sway and control over the world. But a time will come when he will be, when the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. Um, so based on this, on these verses. Uh, people try to connect um you know the 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 second thessalonians pass uh, the, the other passage that we talked about um and this passage uh you know this they say that when the rapture event happens at that time god will collect all the believers and go you know go back into heaven so the presence of the holy spirit will no longer be there um you know in the church in the in the in the church on earth because the church on earth has been collected and taken up into heaven uh, so of course the holy spirit will still be there because he is god and he is everywhere present uh, but he will not be there uh, in in and in in the body of christ you know so which means uh, today it is the church which is praying and interceding and because of the church's presence in the world, because the church is being the salt and light of the earth, because of all the activities that the church is involved in today, therefore, through the church, the Holy Spirit is functioning and controlling lawlessness and not allowing it to completely have its way. And so they say that um, when this First Thessalonians chapter four event takes place, and uh, the the church gets caught up, you know, into the air, the Holy Spirit who is indwelling them because they are the temple of God, right? We believers, we the church are the temple of God. So uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is along with them, kind of leaves in that sense. But of course, he continues to, you know, his presence continues to um, have control over the earth that is there, uh, but no longer functioning through the intercession of the of the saints and all of that you know so uh, they kind of try to bring out that aspect and so they say over here in this particular verse when it says the one who now holds it back the one who is now holding back lawlessness the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way they say this is a direct reference to first thessalonians 4 and it's actually talking about the rapture event and so in that way they kind of connect that passage with 
this passage. Um, uh, now we don't really know, I mean, uh, the details of all of this. Um, but one thing we can uh, maybe say over here when it talks about lawlessness, you know, getting out of control and um, you know becoming stronger, um, it seems to be talking about the tribulation period. Okay, so um, so maybe we could say that uh, over here. Um, whether the whether the rapture event happens or the rapture event does not happen, there will come a time when which God has appointed and fixed when uh, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, will will take a different direction. He will take a step back, and for a temporary period, he will allow the lawlessness to uh, to gain authority, greater authority for a temporary period. And uh, so this, at least, you know, whether people accept the rapture event or not, they will have to agree that this statement seems to be referring to the tribulation period, because when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, in the sense when he takes a step back and he is no longer that actively involved in, in controlling lawlessness, then um, the lawlessness will kind of take over uh, the management of the world and then that is when believers will start undergoing deep tribulation and trial because the because god is at the moment you know uh, no no longer protecting him uh, protecting them to the extent that he was protecting them earlier you know so maybe we could take it in that sense uh, so um, we can say that this is talking about the tribulation period so paul is saying that there will be a tribulation period Paul is saying that there'll be an antichrist who will come. Paul is, in fact, even saying that this person will go and stand in some kind of a temple and declare himself as God. So, is it referring to the to the Jerusalem temple being rebuilt? We do not know because some people they say when it talks about this antichrist coming and you know um, setting himself up in the temple, it's not referring so much to the Jerusalem temple. Rather, it is probably referring to the church which is you know existing at that time the, the 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 believers or the body of christ that is existing at that particular point of time so they say that maybe this man he will try to you know he will rise up in the church community and he will start declaring himself as being the true messiah and then there'll be many people who will get led away but of course there will be some who will hold on to the faith you know and um, and not uh, get swayed by this deceiver uh, so so maybe he does not actually go and stand in the in the in the rebuilt jerusalem temple but rather maybe he actually st stands in the church um uh, and declares himself to be the actual true christ uh, you know and and many will get deceived as a result of that so these are all just you know um different uh, theories that people have about the about what exactly will take place in you know, in the end times uh, now we don't really have any um, clear clarity about what actually will take place these are all just you know um, healthy theories that people are uh, have regarding this matter so um, yeah maybe we can uh, now move on to versus 8 to 12 yeah yeah if someone could read out the that entire chunk uh, or maybe we should do that after the break right because anyway it's now 9 50. so all right we'll we'll get into verse um, 8 and the verses that come after that uh, at 10 o'clock so let's log back in um, at 10 thank you <laughs> 